book of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. We're going to be in exactly the same place that I was last week, and uh, I don't know if I've ever done that before, gone to the same text two Sunday mornings in a row, uh, but it's going to happen this morning. And uh, as I was thinking about the thought and uh, what, what I had in my mind, the Lord kept bringing this same text to my mind, but in a different light, a different way. Matthew chapter number 6 this morning, and I want you to look there at verse number 25. Let's all stand for just a moment as we read God's Word together. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Notice what it says, therefore, Jesus is teaching here. If you're able to stand, I invite you to. If you're not able to, we completely understand. Matthew 6, 25, therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? If the birds of the air, folks, don't have to worry about where they're going to get their next meal, if you're a child of God, neither should you. David said, I have been young and I have been old. Neither have I seen the righteous forsaken, and yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken, neither is seed begging bread. Amen. Notice it says there in verse number 27, Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things, the clothes, the raiments, the drink, the needs that you have. If you'll Listen, if you'll take care of God's business first, He'll take care of your business. Amen. Amen? But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the... As sufficient under the day is the evil thereof. I want to draw your attention back to verse number 32 where it says, Your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. I want to preach to you this morning on some things that we need in these days. Some things that we need. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Lord, I pray that you help me this morning as I try to preach. Lord, I'm not going to be long. I'm not going to be drawn out. Father, I know that many people in here, some of them haven't showered in a while. Some of them haven't had running water in their house. Some of them just getting lights back on. We're tired. We're stressed. We're burnt out. But Father, for just a little bit, I do want to focus on you and your word. So help me now as I preach. Give me power and unction and liberty. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you. You can be seated. This is, of course, the Sermon on the Mount. I don't have a red-letter Bible here with me in the pulpit, but if you have a red-letter Bible, uh, you will see that all of the pages on both pages here at Matthew 6, Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and Matthew 7 are all in red. This is called the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus would have had about... 7,000 people surrounding him while he is preaching up on a hilltop. I've been to that very hilltop in Jerusalem. It's almost interesting the way the Lord worked it out. Uh, That hilltop there is out towards the Sea of Galilee, and it's a natural amphitheater. So Jesus could have been standing on that hilltop or sitting. uh, Back in those days, the rabbis, the teachers would see it. He would be sitting on that hilltop, and the way that the layout of the land is, his voice could easily be heard to about 7,000 people. There are probably about 5,000 people there. Excuse me, about 5,000 men, the Bible says, besides women and children. So a great multitude of people would have been here to hear Jesus preach. And he goes through the Sermon on the Mount. A lot of truths to be gathered from the Sermon on the Mount. But as I was last week in this passage, we'll be here again this week, but a different thought. Jesus, last week I taught on or preached on one day at a time. How Jesus said, don't take thought of the things about tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to take care of itself. You worry about today, amen. We, I preached on one day at a time. 
During these times, we don't know when the water is going to be back on. We don't know what the food shortage is going to be like. We don't know what the water crisis is going to be like. We don't know when the schools are going to start back. You say, preacher, what are we going to do in the future? I don't know. We're just going to take it one day at a time and watch God work miracles. Amen. I mean, it's a miracle. In the city of Asheville, you think we could have gotten a well dug in three days? Before this? No, but somehow a miracle worked out. We were able to get a well dug. 1,200 gallons of water went out from this church yesterday to help people be able to flush their toilets. Amen? Miracles happening. Now notice here, though. Jesus said that your heavenly Father knows the things that you have need of. I want to preach to you this morning some things that we need in these last days. When we started the distribution center last Monday, uh, we got up food and water. That was our primary focus. Then different things were added, baby products, hygiene products, different things. But now notice, those are things that people need. We literally, as I said last week, had a guy walk up the road here and say, thank God this would have been my third day without having clean drinking water. Wild stuff, man. I won't get into all that we rehashed last week, but story after story after story, even people in our own church having to take water from the French broad and boil it and strain it through filters and T-shirts just to have some drinking water, amen? Wild stories. We all probably have stories we could tell. But people say, well, we need food and we need water. Yes, we need food and water, don't we? I mean, that's the basis for life. It's the three, the three rule, the three threes. Three minutes without air, Three days without water, three weeks without food. If you go that much longer without those three things, you'll die, right? But can I say this to you this morning? That we have people that are freaking out about where they're going through their water, freaking out about where they're going to get their food, and that's things that you need for the body, but yet they take no thought about their soul. You know what Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, verse 37? For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Understand this morning that every rich man that has ever died and gone to hell right now would trade every dime of their wealth for one more chance to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. I want you to notice a few things, though, that we need. not talking about physically. We're talking about spiritually. First of all, number one, we need the church. We need the church. Listen, I'm not, I'm not trying to be ugly or hateful this morning. Please don't take it the wrong way. I'm one of those preachers, I kind of say what I mean, and I mean what I say, so just buckle up. But can I say this? It's not, listen, you go around to the places that are open. I'm not saying it's exclusively churches, but look how many churches around here are helping people. I thank God for the church. I thank God for places like this, like ours and other churches in the area that are opening their doors and are letting people come in and eat, get hot meals. Some of the ones that have showers, letting them come in and bathe. I wish we had showers here. We'd allow that to happen. Understand, I thank God for churches. We need churches in times like these. I listen, I understand that churches, listen, not every church is a good church. I understand that. Listen, you come to this church long enough, you're going to find flaws with it. We are not the perfect church. Do you know why Bible Baptist Church is not a perfect church? Because we let people come to it, amen? <laughs> if, we, if we wanted a perfect church, we would put boards up over the windows, put locks on the doors, and throw everybody out, myself included, because nobody is perfect. Somebody said, Preacher, why do churches have problems? And I say, because we let people go to them. And if, you've, and if you and your family come to our church, you'll be one more problem in our church. Right? Because we all have problems. We all have faults. We all have failures. Everybody, listen, everybody has things that they deal with and struggle with. But can I say this? I believe this with my whole heart. There is no organization on planet Earth uh, that in times like this is doing more than the local churches. Amen. Amen. I, won't, I don't even get me started. You say, preacher, is FEMA here? If they are, I haven't seen them. Amen. Maybe they've done something somewhere. But you know what? Constantly, over and over and over, people have said, if it wasn't for this church, uh, we wouldn't know where we'd get our next case of water. If it wasn't for this church, we wouldn't have known where we'd gotten food. Listen, and I know there are other churches around doing the same thing, and thank God for them. But I'm glad that we can be a beacon of hope up on the hill here in Emma to shine the light that, hey, not only do we just say a bunch of stuff from the Bible, but we try to live it and preach it and teach it. Amen. Your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Everybody follow that okay? 
I could get up here all day long and give you flowery speeches and tell you all these eloquent words, but if I'm not out here trying to get people to Jesus and trying to feed them and clothe them and trying to give them some water and trying to show them the love of Christ, all this is is nothing but a bunch of, as Paul said, a bunch of tinkling symbols. Amen. Just a bunch of empty words. I thank God for you. You need the church this morning. Amen. I need the church. We need the fellowship of believers coming in for at least one day a week. I mean, we got church three times a week here, but at least on Sunday mornings coming in here and fellowshipping and getting around each other, encouraging one another, where we turn off the cell phones, we turn off the TV, we turn off all the lies and all the scams and all the things going on outside of these four walls, and we come in here and we focus on the most important thing in the world, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen? We need the church. You say, well, I went to a church one time and they were mean to me. Yeah, join the club, amen. I mean, I've been in church my whole life. Church people can be mean. Church people can be this, they be that. But listen, I thank God for the church. I thank God for this local church, amen. Amen. I thank God for this local church where we got people that love each other and care about each other. Not only do you need the church, but can I say this? You need the commandments of God. You know what we need in these days? We need the Bible. Can I say this this morning? You are looking at an old-fashioned, hell, fire, and brimstone, Bible-believing preacher. Amen? I mean, you're looking at somebody, I believe every word in that Bible. You say, preacher, you believe that God created... You mean to tell me that you believe God created everything in seven 24-hour days? No, I don't believe that. I believe he did it in six days. He rested on the seventh. Amen? Amen. You say, you believe in the Big Bang Theory, preacher? Oh, yeah. I believe that God spake and bang, it was there. Amen. I believe the Bible exactly as it's written from cover to cover. Amen. I believe what the Bible says is wrong is wrong and what the Bible says right is right. I believe this book. Listen, you understand that this Bible, people say, well, preacher, it's so outdated. and it's so. Th-. Do you know that Bible is more up to date than tomorrow's newspaper? I won't take time this morning to go through it all, but I could show you scripture after scripture after scripture of how the Bible lays out the things to come. And I'm telling you, folks, I've been studying that book for a long time, reading through it for my 16th time through, and I'm telling you, it's all laying out exactly how the Lord said it would. Exactly how it said it would. So I don't believe that book. That's fine. The Bible says, Paul says, Shall the unbelief of some make the word of God of none effect? You can believe that I've got a $20 bill in my pocket, or you cannot believe it. That does not change the fact that I have a $20 bill in my pocket. I don't know if I asked for it now. It's mine, amen. As soon as the restaurants open up, I'm going to buy me the biggest steak you can find. Somebody say amen right there. T-bone, rare. Somebody say amen right there. If you like, listen, if you, if, you, if you eat your steak more than medium rare, you don't like the taste of steak, amen. That's all I'm saying. I'm being facetious this morning. Listen to me now. You know what you need? You need the commandments of God. This book will tell you how to live. This book will tell you how to be the right kind of husband, the right kind of wife, the right kind of mama, the right kind of daddy. It'll tell you how to be the right kind of financial person. It'll tell you how to run your home, how you run your business, how to run everything in your life. That I'm telling you, that book changes lives right there. That book changes lives. You say, preacher, would you rather have a society of people? Uh, uh, you, you, uh, well, well, we don't want to force our beliefs on anybody. I understand. I believe that. I believe. That. Listen, you're looking at somebody that believes that you can practice anything you want to practice. You can believe whatever you want to believe. I don't believe in shoving my religion down anybody's throat. I don't believe in trying to make anybody do it. But what I'm saying is if you want to know what true peace and true happiness and true contentment and a life that is fulfilled and content, I'm telling you, live it by this book. It'll change your life. People can say what they want to, but I'm talking about drug addicts getting clean. Drunks getting sober. Cheaters and fornicators getting faithful. I'm talking about murderers being forgiven. I'm talking about adulterers being washed clean. I'm talking about street walkers getting off the street. I'm talking about homeless people turning their lives around. All because they found the truths of that book. Amen. You can say what you want to, but my friend, that book has done more for civilization than any book ever. You can take that book and put it into the deepest, darkest jungles of Africa or South America or wherever, and it changes lives. And It'll change your life. Not only do we need the church, not only do we need the commandments, but last of all, I'm, almost, I'm, I'm not going to be long this morning, but last of all, more than anything, I saved the best one for last. You know what you need? You need Christ. 
I need Christ. Can I say this to you this morning? Jesus Christ was not some kind of mythological character. Do you know that there are more historical references to Jesus Christ than there are Julius Caesar? But nobody doubts the existence of Julius Caesar. But everybody doubts the existence of Jesus Christ. Well, I don't even know if Jesus was a real person. Listen, you say, atheists will say this. Well, you know, I'm not sure God exists. You know, atheists cannot find God for the same reason murderers can't find the police. They aren't, they're not looking for him, amen? <laughs> listen, you ever heard that there's no atheists in the foxholes, amen? Uh, you, you, listen, I, I, I know of people that were being swept away in their homes. I bet you every one of them, whether they's an atheist or not, were crying out to God. E- even the people that deny, the atheists that deny the existence of God don't even, don't, I mean, hate the concept of God even. As soon as they're getting ready to get in the wreck, they say, oh my God. Huh, I know you're saying it is a euphemism, but why are you choosing that one? Isn't that interesting? Nobody says, oh, my Buddha. You know, nobody says that, do they? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Nobody says, yeah, you can just go to purgatory. Nobody says that, do they? Amen. Nobody says, yeah, just go on to that. Hot. No, they say go to hell. Where do they get that? I'm telling you, that book is in, listen, every atheist is influenced by that book. Psalm 14, 1, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. I'm here to tell you this morning, every atheist, when they stand before God, I believe this all my heart, they're going to look up and say, I've been expecting this. Everybody, no, listen, you walk through the woods and you see a house, you assume there was a builder. You walk through the woods and you find a, or excuse me, you walk through an art gallery and you see a painting, you assume there's a painter. When you walk through this creation, you have to assume there's a creator. Amen. Here's the problem, though. Mankind violated the law of his creator. Adam, you say, preacher, you believe in the whole Adam and Eve story? Oh, do I ever. I look around and I see the sinfulness of man, and it lets me know that mankind sinned against his creator. The things going on in this world, the unspeakable atrocities that are happening, the things that have even happened in this city when things people shooting each other over water, stabbing each other over gas. I mean, just the simple things like that, it lets me know mankind is sinful. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Adam ate the forbidden fruit. Adam and Eve, you say, was it an apple? The Bible never says what kind of fruit it was. It could have been whatever. Who knows what it was? But they ate the forbidden fruit and they sinned against God. And it separated man from God. Now notice here. Here's the story. For 6,000 years now, mankind has tried to get back to God. You ever notice that? Mankind wants to get bigger and better and better. We want to progress civilization. But understand, things are never going to get better until Jesus Christ comes back. Things are only going to get worse. The Bible says evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. But for 6,000 years, man has tried to get better without having God. And you can see where we're at. It's not working. The Middle East is in a crisis. Russia and Ukraine, China and Taiwan, all the different things. I mean, the Middle East is a powder keg. What is it, NATO now testing nuclear warheads again? All this crazy, crazy stuff. I mean, the worst hurricane season we've ever seen. Florida getting ready to get pelted with another hurricane. Potential of another one coming up and bringing rain into this. I mean, on and on and on we could go this morning. Things aren't getting better. They're only getting worse. And that's why you better make sure you've got Christ. <clears throat> Mankind and God separated from our sin. You ever lied before? You ever disobeyed your mother and father when you were a child? You ever took God's name in vain? You ever looked at somebody with lust? The Bible says Jesus said, whoever looks on somebody with lust in their heart has committed adultery already with them in their heart. You ever murder? I've never killed anybody. That's why I hear, well, preacher, I've never killed anybody. All right, Jesus said, if you've ever been angry with your brother without cause, you ever been mad at somebody or hated somebody, the Bible says it's the same as hatred, it's just in your heart. You ever coveted? You ever put something before God? I mean, I'm, I'm, if you haven't noticed, I'm, going, I'm just going through the Ten Commandments this morning. We're just talking about the Ten Commandments. If we were to go through every one of the Ten Commandments, I dare say that every single one of us has committed most, if not all of them. If not physically, we've committed them in our heart. 
And I'm going to tell you what, because we've broken God's law, the Bible says we'll all stand guilty before God on the day of judgment. My friend, if I could get one thing to you, if I could get people to understand one thing, one day every single one of us will stand before a holy, just God and we will give an account for the things that we've done. The Bible says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. You say, you're just trying to scare us. You're just, no, no, I'm not trying to scare you. The Bible, says, the Bible says this, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade all men. You know, you see these people, sometimes they'll have it tattooed on them or sometimes they'll have it like in the back of their car. They'll say, only God can judge me. Yeah, and that ought to petrify you. <laughs> they, they say it like it's a badge of honor. No, I listen, only God can judge me and I'm scared to death about it, amen? Our sin has separated us from God. Because of our sin, because we've broken God's law, we are guilty in the sight of God. And because of that, there's only two places you go when you die. I've read that Bible through 16 times thus far. I'm going to keep reading it till I die. Notice this. Nowhere in that Bible does it ever talk about purgatory. There's no in-between. There's no, well, preacher, when I die, I'll just lay in the ground. Your body will lay in the ground, but your soul goes to either heaven or hell. The Bible says in Hebrews 9, 27, and, uh, is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, boom, the judgment. Listen to me very close. I'm almost done here this morning. What you do with Jesus Christ now determines where you spend eternity later. Amen. Listen to me very closely. You say, preacher, how can I know for a fact when I die I'm going to heaven? How can I know for a fact that I'm right with God. How can I know for a fact that my sins are forgiven? It's very simple. A, you have to admit you're a sinner. I don't need to know all your sins. You don't need to know all my sins. If we were to sit here and tell each other all of our sins, we'd probably all be disgusted with each other and we'd never come back to church here. If I knew the things that went through your mind in a week, I wouldn't let you come to church here. And if you knew the things that went through my mind in a week, you wouldn't want to come to church here anyway. We're all just a bunch of sinners. But because of that... It dooms and damns us for hell for all of eternity. And you've got to realize that you're a sinner. You've got to realize you've broken God's law. You've got to realize the things that you have done, the violations that you have made against God, they are holding you guilty before a holy God. But not only that, here's, that's the bad news. And by the way, no matter how much good you try to do, you can never get into heaven with your good works. You say, well, I've given money. You can give all the money in the world. But I do, preacher, uh, my good works, I, I think my good works have outweighed my bad works. Well, hold on a second. If I kill somebody and I say, judge, I know I killed that guy, but look at how much good I've done in the past. You should just let me go. He's not going to let me go. It doesn't matter how much good I've done. It doesn't matter. Judge, I promise I'll never do it any, ever again. It doesn't matter if I promise I'll never do it again. I have to be held accountable for the wrong I've done regardless of how much good I've done. It's the same way with God and your sin. You're not going to stand before God and say, I know I did some wrong, but look at all the good I did. No, good works do not outweigh bad works. They don't negate them. It's not like a, which one do I have more of? It's not that kind of thing. The Bible says, if a man, James chapter 2, verse 10, if a man keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. That means if you've even just told one little white lie, which I promise you, me and you have done a lot more than just tell one little white lie, the Bible says it's bad enough to separate us from God. No matter how you say, I've been baptized. Listen, we've got a baptistry up here. Water cannot wash away your sin. You can be, as they used to say, you can be dunked till the tadpoles know your name. It ain't going to help you. Water does not wash away sin. Only the blood of Jesus can wash away sin. So that's the bad news. You're a dirty, rotten, low-down, no-good sinner, along with the preacher, and we're all just doomed and damned for hell. But here's the wonderful news. You ready? The Bible says that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loved you so much that He sent Jesus Christ, His Son, came down, Jesus Christ came down to this earth. He was God manifested in the flesh. He took all your sin, all the wrong you've ever done, all the sin you've ever committed. He took it on himself and he died in your place. I should have been the one hanging on that cross. 
I should have had my beard ripped out. I should have had the crown of thorns put on my head. I should have been the one that they spat in my face. I should have been the one that died. I was the sinner. I was the guilty one. But God, listen, the innocent man, Jesus Christ, took the guilty man's place. It was the Savior dying for the sinner. It was the godly dying for the ungodly. It was the just dying for the unjust. It was the innocent dying for the guilty. And he endured my punishment. And the Bible says that he laid in the grave for three days, but he physically, bodily arose three days later. A, you have to admit you're a sinner. You say, well, I don't think what I'm doing is wrong. Okay, well, they that are holding me, not a physician. If you, don't think you're, if you don't think you're a sinner, you have no need of a Savior. But if you'll admit you're a sinner, you say, yeah, you know what, preacher, I'm going to be real with you. I'm a sinner, and I've done wrong. If you can admit that, you're on the first step. Number two, you've got to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and rose again from the dead. And C, A, B, C, it's as easy as A, B, C. C, confess Jesus as your Lord. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. You say, preacher, is it really that simple? It is. Listen, it's so simple, most people are going to miss it. Can it really be that simple, preacher? Yeah, see, you think you've got to pray the rosary or you've got to light candles or you've got to come down here and, 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 and do all these different things and go through baptism and live a... Listen, man, you don't have to live... The, listen, people say, well, preacher, I'm afraid I can't live it. Jesus never asked you to live it. He asked you to believe it. You don't clean a fish before you catch it. You say, but preacher, you don't know how bad I've been. You don't know the things I've done. You don't know how wicked I am. Listen, man, the Bible, you know what the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote 13 books of the New Testament, and he says, he, Paul, the Apostle Paul literally killed Christians for being Christians. And then, on the way down to Damascus, Jesus Christ appeared to him, blew him off his horse, literally, and said, why are you persecuting me? And Paul got saved. And you know what he said? He said, I persecuted the church of God. I killed Christians just because they were Christians. He said, and God saved me. And this is what he said. He says that I am the chief of sinners. I heard a preacher say one time, if God can save the chief, he can save all the Indians. Amen. Amen. I want you to hear me this morning. If you're here this morning, you say, preacher, I do not know if I were to die this morning. If I were were to die this morning, I do not know where I'd spend eternity. I want you to know this morning that you can know for a fact. Every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. Listen to me very closely. But can I ask you a question this morning? Would there be anybody in here that say, Preacher, if I'm just being honest, and I'm not going to come to you, I'm not going to embarrass you in any way, I promise you, I'm not going to embarrass you in any way at all. I just want to pray for you. But with nobody looking around, would there be anybody say, oh, Preacher, if I were to die today, or if I would have been one of those ones in the flood, Preacher, I'm going to be honest. I do not know where I'd spend eternity. Preacher, would you please pray for me? I'm concerned about my soul. Would you just very quietly and very quickly, just right where you're sitting, would you just slip your hand right up and right back down? Preacher, that's me this morning. Would you please pray for me? Anybody like that this morning? Anybody at all? Preacher, pray for me. I don't know where I'm going to spend eternity. Please pray for me. All right, let me ask you another question. How do you say, Preacher, I know that I'm saved. I know that I've trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. But Preacher, I'm going to be honest. I've just gotten away from the Lord. I've, I've just, I've just, I, I have gotten away from Him. I know that I'm going to heaven. I know I've trusted Him as my Savior. But preacher, I need some rekindling in my life. You were talking about needing the church and needing Christians. Preacher, that's me this morning. Would you please pray for me? Anybody like that? Would you just quietly and quickly slip your hand? Thank you, I see that one. Thank you, I see those. Thank you, I see those. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to play on the piano and I'm going to pray. As soon as I get done praying... Right there in your seats, why don't you just pray this morning. If you'd like to come to the front here, you can. I invite you to come. But if you want to pray right there in your seats, you can. How about for just a moment as he begins to play, we talk with the Lord about some things and you get some things right with the Lord. Father, I love you. I pray now that you'd get people, Lord, to pray. I pray that you do a work in people's hearts this morning. We love you in Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed, he's going to play for just a moment. If you'd like to come to the front, you can. If you want to stay in your seat, you can. But for just a moment, I want to give you some time just to talk to the Lord. If you're not saved, if you're not sure where you're going to spend eternity right now, all you got to do is just say, Lord, 
I know I'm a sinner. I know I've done wrong. And Lord, I know that I, I deserve punishment. But Lord, I believe you died on the cross for me. And I believe you rose again. And I believe you can save me. And I ask you to forgive me right now. He'll do it for you. He'll forgive you. He'll save your soul. He'll wash you clean in his blood. All you got to do is ask him. If you're walking far from the Lord this morning, just some things in your heart not right, the Lord can work on you this morning. He can do a miracle in your life.